And good morning, everybody. All right. Um, as Drina said, uh, uh, we're going to talk this morning about democratic transitions and governance. And I uh, would like to frame that in the sense that this is a time of testing for Africa. Um, on February 15th of this year, um, Cyril uh, Ramaphosa became president of uh, South Africa. He was sworn in. Um, and with his taking office, he um, succeeded what had been eight years of very turbulent governance in South Africa, led by Jacob Zuma. And during uh, Mr. Zuma's tenure as president in South Africa, there was a steady stream of allegations of corruption, abuse of power, um, obstruction, obstruction of justice, politicization of the police force, uh, intelligence services. Um, and a decline in government services uh, overall. Now, so rampant was the um, allegations of patronage that the term state capture, or you know, the, the notion that uh, different organs of the state become controlled by private interest, um, the, the term became a household, uh, a household word in South Africa. Yet, um, in the end, um, uh, Mr. Zuma uh, was forced to step down, was, was forced to step down, and uh, uh, President Ramaphosa took office. And this was in no small part due to the pushback that uh, uh, President Zuma faced during his time in office. And this pushback came from uh, a number of different places. Um, number one was the independent media in South Africa. You know, they were re relentlessly exposing and talking about the different misdeeds of the Zuma government. Um, there was, uh, uh, in the South African system, a public protector's office. So uh, did special investigation, um, trying to uh, look at the legal basis of the different allegations. Two different public protectors issued, you know, two um, very comprehensive reports that documented um, the, the the various uh, allegations um, that had been made against Mr. Zuma. There was an active uh, opposition uh, set of parties that were uh, continually calling for higher standards. Uh, and even the African National Congress, uh, the ruling party, um, ultimately came to the conclusion that Mr. Zuma was um, uh, more of a liability than an asset. And you know this was a, a no small determination because many in the African National Congress had come to benefit from Mr. Zuma's patronage. Uh, and finally, um, uh, South Africa has term limits. So even though uh, Mr. Zuma was forced to step down uh, a year before he would have uh, normally, he was faced with um, uh, uh, end of his term uh, regardless, uh, which would have led to, to one form of transition or another. And so South Africa passed its test. You know, it faced very strong strains on its democratic systems, but it passed. Um, and we can contrast that with um, a number of other cases in Africa in the past year, um, where faced with similar strains, um, they didn't pass. Cases in Zimbabwe or Kenya, Uganda, Democratic Republic of Congo, Burundi and South Sudan. Um, and there are many reasons uh, for the different outcomes. Each country is different, of course, and there's a lot of unique circumstances. Um, but I would uh, draw to your attention the importance of institutions of accountability 
for leading to these different outcomes. Uh, in effect, these institutions of accountability are various uh, means of checks and balances in a society. And importantly, um, this is more than just the traditional uh, different branches of government and the different power that's shared among these different branches, the legislative, judicial, and executive. Um, but rather, it's uh, layers of accountability of both formal governmental uh, mechanisms of oversight as well as informal or societally based uh, mechanisms of, of oversight. It includes a, a merit based professional civil service. Um, includes political parties, both ruling parties and opposition parties, and the different standards that they um, seek to uphold. It includes independent prosecutors' offices that has the jurisdiction to do independent investigations. Um, it depends on a free press and access to information. It depends on an independent central bank that can set monetary policy um, aside from from politics, um, requires an active civil society and people getting organized and raising concerns. Um, it even uh, requires a apolitical private sector where access to property or credit or licenses can happen uh, without having uh, political ties to people in power. Um, and there's also a, a role for international organizations, regional organizations, and setting standards and norms uh, within these different contexts. So this isn't an exhaustive list, um, but it, it's meant to just show the different levels of accountability that um, take root in a society and which help to keep a democratic course on track. I often refer to these um, as layers or, or, or a web of accountability. Um, another uh, image of this is of a steel cable. You think of a steel cable that holds up a bridge, and these steel, steel cables are made of in, individual strands of steel. Um, each strand on its own isn't that strong. It can be easily broken. However, when it's intertwined together, with you know, dozens of other cables, it becomes a pretty strong uh, support. And it's in the same way that these institutions of accountability, there isn't any single one of them that uh, is uh, a magic bullet, but rather it's the combination of them that leads to this web of support, this, this, this layering, this buffering that protects democracies and allows them to stay on course. And you know, my message today, it's building those institutions of accountability that is the focus of strengthening democracy in Africa today. It's the real challenge to building democracy in Africa today. And in recognizing that, it's important to point out that you know, there's often a, an assumption that democracy is all about elections. And yes, and elections are a key part of democracies. But democ elections are just one event. And democracy is more than that. Democracy is a process of governance. It's a day-to-day -day process. It's a matter of um, respecting individual political rights and civil liberties. It's a matter of recognizing that minorities or opposition parties still have rights, even if they're not in power. It's a matter of adhering to the rule of law, whether you're in power or out of power. It's the idea that the law applies equally to uh, individuals, uh, regardless of their allegiance to the president. Um, you know, all of these norms, all of these uh, features of governing um, uh, take place over time, and that is what um, defines democracies, and that is what these institutions of accountability um, help to support and to sustain over time. So 
why is this important? You know, why is why is talking about democracy important in the context of Africa and in the context of security? Um, well, the reason is there's a very close relationship between democracy and stability. You know, of the 12 African countries that are currently in conflict, nine are considered not free or autocratic by, by Freedom House. Those nine uh, account for over 70% of the 24 million uh, forcibly displaced people on the continent. It's important to keep in mind that um, all African conflicts today are internal. Meaning they didn't, they're not interstate conflicts or not invading armies from across the border. They emerge from uh, instability within a country, reflecting um, a rupturing of their political processes or, you know, a sense of disenfranchisement or, or a sense of disparity and grievances that can't be resolved through political means. Um, and so that is what's causing the instability. It's, it's the fact that there are political crises that are unresolved, um, which then turns into conflict. So recognizing the governance elements of, uh, uh, of these conflicts, I think is really important for how we think about engaging uh, these countries and, 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 and underscoring the importance of democracies. Um, you know, relatedly, um, there's a very strong relationship between corruption and conflict. Or conversely, you know, the absence of corruption and 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 stability, a you know, very positive correlation there, um, and you know this makes sense anecdotally when you see the disparities in resources that go to people with ties to political, um, you know, politically powerful individuals, um, and this tend, tends to break down by groups or by regions and leads to very strong uh, polarization within societies. And when not resolved, or when not the means to resolve that internally, it can turn into conflict. So authoritarian systems tend to be more unstable. You know, converse democracies tend to do a much better job at avoiding conflict. They have means of resolving political crises um, there's a, a greater propensity to respecting the rule of law and property rights, which creates a more reliable investment environment. This in turn helps spur economic growth. Democracies have a stronger track record for human development. You know, all these things have positive uh, benefits in terms of avoiding conflict. So let's put this in historical context. Um, these are trend lines of uh, Africa's regime um, uh, categorization over the last uh, 25 years or so since the end of the Cold War. And we can draw a number of different uh, observations from this. You'll see the, uh, the black line is the number of autocracies uh, in, 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 on the continent. The blue line on the bottom is the number of democracies and the yellow line are countries in between. That's a very simple uh, categorization. Um, but nonetheless, I think it's illustrative for showing us a couple of things. First, you know, since the end of the Cold War, we've seen significant change. At that time, nearly all African countries were autocracies. And, and since then, there's been a dramatic decline. Um, <clears throat> meanwhile, we've seen uh, at the time of the end of the Cold War, there's just two uh, democracies, and, and and now we have seven or eight. So there's been a, a gradual increase. But the real change is that we've seen most African countries move out of the autocratic column into this middle column. And countries that are that have made some changes. They've built some of their democratic institutions, but they haven't consolidated these changes. Um, and so they're still on the path. 
And I should point out, I mean, even when you reach the, the democratic threshold, it doesn't mean that, you know, that the story is over. These things still need to be renewed and, and, and maintained. But I think the real takeaway for this is that so many African countries, um, and I would say there's two dozen actively engaged uh, countries that are in the process currently of trying to build those institutions. And so that's the focus of the democratic story in Africa today. And the challenges that they face um, to do so are a big part of um, uh, of the pushback and, 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 and the political back and forth that we see. And I think it's worth noting that we hear a lot about the, the failures, the backsliding cases in the in the media today. And they're and, and they're and they happen. But what this trend line shows is that there are also positive steps being made. Um, uh, and, and, and there are successes that are out there that are happening. Moreover, um, when there are cases of backsliding, um, they tend not to be um, forever. Uh, you know, and statistically, uh, within three to five years, countries that have, have taken a step back tend to resume or take another, they move forward again in terms of their democratic path building. And so these, tend, these things tend not to be static. You know, it's a constant battle for governance norms within many countries and as, as for the continent as a whole. Um, and it, we're in a settling out period. And just what are the norms going to be? And so it's a period of flux, which, I, uh, which, which is why I talk about this as being a period of testing for Africa and whether they can build the systems um, that are strong enough to allow them to consolidate those institutions and, and get on the democratic path um, uh, for the long term. I think a, a, a worthwhile um, example of one of the positive cases is Ethiopia. Ethiopia still cannot be considered a democracy, but for a long time it's been in the autocratic column. Uh, but over the last few years, um, even though Ethiopia had been seen as a stable country, there were a growing number of protests all around the country. Ethiopia has Africa's largest military, and it was being increasingly deployed to suppress these protests. Um, and they were finding that they, they, they couldn't keep up. And there had been deaths, there had been arrest, but the protests keep happening kept happening. Uh, and uh, eventually, the ruling party, the EPRDF, um, uh, decided um, that it would uh, uh, bring in a new prime minister. Uh, they selected um, a reformist, um, Abiy Hamid, who came from one of the lesser known coalition partners. He represented uh, the majority ethnic group in Ethiopia. Um, and he came in and changed course. He did things that we haven't seen in Ethiopia. He freed political prisoners. He recognized that there had been abuses by the security forces. Um, he said that Ethiopia does need to move to a democratic system. Um, these things were wildly popular in Ethiopia. Um, protests went down, you know, instead there were mass, mass rallies in support of him. So he created political capital that allowed him then to take on other reforms and other changes. And including, and importantly for our discussion about security, you know, he was able to negotiate um, a uh, end to the, you know, 20 year stalemate um, uh, um, uh, I guess the, the never resolved conflict with Eritrea on the border. So they were able to sign a peace deal, reopen those borders. Tens of thousands of troops that had been deployed along the border 
on each side, we're able to stand down. You know, it's a huge economic savings. It's going to open up trade again, op open up access to those ports. So lots of implications from this political change um, that was more inclusive, it's more participatory, um, that's moving Ethiopia on a more democratic path. Still a long ways to go. There's still going to be pushback. Um, but it's an example of how political change can can lead to other sorts of positive changes uh, on the continent. Um, nonetheless, a lot of countries are stuck. They're in this stalled position where they've made partial progress, but they can't get over the hump. Um, and, um, you know, there are many reasons for this. But clearly, a lot of these countries are facing pushback from uh, um, those with interest in maintaining the status quo, people who benefited under the old system. And so that's the challenge for this institutional reform. Um, and Africa is dealing with a long legacy of what's called big man rule, the idea of a patronage, personal, personality-based political system where um, what the leader determines is above or below the law uh, is what's enforced rather than what's in the constitution or what's uh, on the books. And as a result, many state organs tend to be loyal to the individual rather than to the state, um, which leads to a lot of the instabilities that we see. And um, <clears throat> This is just a current breakdown of, of where some of this of these uh, states are currently uh, on the continent. Again, you see the long list of democratizers. Um, and so that's where the real change is happening today. But one of the institutional changes that I would highlight as an example of sort of this pushback is in the area of, of term limits. So with the movement towards democracy at the end of the Cold War, uh, a number of African countries began to institute term limits on the, on the time that uh, presidents could stay in office. And this is particularly important in African context for the reason I talked about, whether you have this legacy of big man rule, where individuals, presidents, once in power, would, would use that to monopolize both political and economic power in a society and stay in power for life. And that would then feed corruption and, um, and underdevelopment. Uh, and so by limiting the time in office of these leaders, the idea was that you were going to help facilitate um, more pattern succession, more power, uh, a pattern of power sharing. And um, indeed, uh, you know, that has had some positive effects. Today, there are 21 uh, countries in Africa, those in the green, that have presidential term limits. Um, another 15 countries have the, the laws in the books, though it, it hasn't been upheld yet. Uh, those presidents haven't come up to their, their, their limits. Those are the, the beige um, color countries. So, you know, 36 countries out of 54 um, have at least made a, um, a determination that there'll be term limits. Nonetheless, since 2015, we've seen five countries um, that have evaded term limits. So president and leaders in those countries had term limits on the books and they were able to get the constitution changed or somehow um, evade those strictures um, so they could stay in office longer. So there's a, there's a total of um, 18 countries that don't have term limits. And the differences between those that do and those, those that don't are, are striking. Of the 21 countries that have and have upheld term limits, the average time uh, of uh, average time in office for presidents is about four years. For the countries 
that don't have term limits or that have evaded term limits, the average time in office for presidents is 22 years. Um, and coming back to our point about conflict, you know, for those countries where uh, leaders have evaded term limits, a third of them are in conflict. So less than 10% of those with term limits are, are in conflict. So building these institutions is hard, but they have a huge impact uh, on stability and on governance. All right, so what can be done to help support democracy in Africa? You know, ultimately, passing these tests has to be done by the Africans themselves, by citizens, by leaders in these countries. Um, it has to, it, it's a process that has to be owned internally. It's not something that could be brought from the outside. That said, you know, there are regional and international norms and standards that can help um, raise the standards, that it can help strengthen these institutions um, so that these African reformers can um, move their societies forward and, and pass the test. Uh, it's not about picking winners and losers on an individual basis. Rather, it's about how do you strengthen the institutions that allow um, these positive outcomes to emerge. When we talk about institutions, you know, we have to not recognize this as a long-term process. It's a decade or longer process for uh, creating these institutions, for sustaining these institutions. That requires staying the course, both uh, domestically, but then in terms of our international engagements. And as you'll recall from our web of accountability discussion, you know, there's many different ways that accountability can take root in a society. So there's many potential ways for international engagement that can support that process. You know, and there are independent judiciaries, there's strengthening legislators, so they play a, a stronger over, oversight role, supporting small and medium-sized enterprises so that um, you'll create a, a private sector that's um, vibrant and independent of uh, political influences. Um, but to close, I'd, I'd, I'll just bring attention to four different areas of institution strengthening that I think um, deserve attention. The first is on uh, the importance of uh, ensuring a level playing field. You know, because of the, of the progress that's been made on the democratic front in Africa, today we see on average 15 to 20 elections, national elections every year. You know, that didn't used to be the case. That's a, that's a positive sign. Unfortunately, you know, the, the quality of those elections varies greatly. And so I think, first of all, it's important to recognize that and not afford each of them the same degree of credibility as, as, as the others. But I think um, working to help strengthen the independence of electoral commissions um, can help ensure that the quality of elections uh, will be um, higher um, and that it will uh, facilitate more genuine participation, engagement from citizens, uh, and, and make these meaningful contests um, that uh, really lead to legitimate leaders uh, emerging at the end. The second is the importance of independent media. Um, without information, you can't have accountability. And journalists, media are the main conveyors of this information. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, we're seeing uh, an increase in attacks on African journalists. Um, people are jailed and killed. 97% you know, of all murders of journalists go unsolved. Um, and, you know, for those in power who are benefiting from patronage, other forms of corruption, abuse of power, they don't want these things to be exposed. So there are, you know, they're going to try to restrict that information. So. Journalists play a very unique role in a democratic society. Um, their rights, their protections need to be safeguarded. Um, third is the importance of valuing legitimacy. And 
by this, I'm saying we just need to recognize there's this huge variance in the governance models in Africa. And so um, we should recognize those leaders who've come to power through legitimate means and afford them the respect and opportunities and, um, uh, and platforms that um, they've earned relative to other leaders. So, you know, who comes to the White House or who the Secretary of State visits, what kind of aid packages we have, what kind of security cooperation, um, those things should vary depending on the means by which these leaders have come to power. And that way we can reinforce the positive norms that are out there. These things are noticed in Africa. And um, when they aren't upheld, it tends to lower the standards. Uh, interestingly, you know, many authoritarian leaders love, you know, they, 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 they crave that legitimacy. It's why they hold elections, because they want to claim that they have that mandate. And so we have to be sophisticated enough to recognize when it's genuinely earned and, and when it's not. And then fourth, I would uh, uh, highlight the importance of um, trying to strengthen a, a professional security sector. In many African countries, the police, military, presidential, presidential guards are the tools that um, repressive leaders use to keep their populations in check. And this uh, uh, ends up um, not creating stability, but really just creating a pressure cooker environment that will end up uh, spilling over in different ways of instability. Um, security leaders are often susceptible to being co-opted uh, by uh, political, um, you know, by politicians who are trying to serve their particular interest, and in the process, ends up undermining the integrity of their respective institutions. Uh, in places, recently, we've seen uh, political leaders uh, actively trying to subvert the political process because they have different interests that they're protecting. Um, and so that's an area of concern uh, that we need to be mindful of. But you know, I think it's interesting, uh, some recent survey work we've done here at the Africa Center uh, among African military professionals showed that the um, engagements with international um, security actors through professional military education institutions or through peacekeeping deployments, those types of experiences are the most formative experiences that these African security professionals have in their identity formation, in setting standards in terms of their uh, sense of professionalism. And so the opportunity to engage positively um, and the importance of these investments, I think, can't be uh, overestimated. Um, they, they do make a difference. Um, and sometimes we just don't see that uh, until it plays out over time. So in some, uh, Africa's democracies and democratizers at all levels are, are facing strains uh, as they try to move towards what is still a new governance model. We're seeing progress. We see some setbacks. And rather than just chasing the crisis du jour, um, African reformers and their external partners uh, need to think about how they can be better prepared to pass the test and what sorts of institutions um, need to be strengthened and how we can do a better job of strengthening these institutions so that when they do face the inevitable strains, that they're able to pass those tests and in the process reach that sustainable stability that typifies established democracies. All right, thank you very much.